first up is Encanto, which is Disney Animation's latest animated film. It is actually their 60th animated feature film, which is very impressive. It takes place in Colombia, and it centers around a family called the Madrigals, who are magical except for one of the kids, played by Stephanie Beatriz. And I was very hyped for this film. It looks absolutely gorgeous. The music is by Lin-Manuel Miranda, which I'm still a sucker for, although I'm starting to feel like maybe I need a little bit of a break. And I say that because his last few films have all had music in the exact same style. And he, of course, has like a musical styling that is apparent in all of them. But I think the last few original ones have had somewhat similar-ish themes and sort of musical inspirations. Uh, the last one I'm thinking of is Vivo, which is a Sony animated film. And no, they're not the same film, but I do feel like musically... They felt more similar than, say, something like Moana, which he also was heavily involved in the score for. I think my expectations of the film might have been a little too high. It was it was a great film. I enjoyed it very much. I think it's beautifully done. You know, I think the themes are really important. I almost wish it... There's a theme of otherness to it that, you know, depending on your circumstances, because this one member of the family is sort of an outcast because she's not like the other, she doesn't have a magical gift, you could pretty easily connect the dots to that being a queer allegory. And I almost wanted the film to just embrace that and just go with it. I think for every cliche that this film actually managed to avoid, it also fell into exactly just as many. So it's it's it was an interesting balance. And I think the other thing that I felt like I was missing from it, and this is going to be a slightly odd criticism, but... I just wanted there to be like one banger of a song that really encompassed the entire thing for me. Again, the soundtrack is very catchy, very well done. There's one sequence in which I was like, did the singer breathe at all? Because it's the fastest I've ever heard anyone sing. It was very impressive, but... And, and maybe this is just a, a sort of naivety when it comes to musicals, but I was like, you know, with Frozen, you've got Let It Go. With Moana, you've arguably got Your Welcome. You know, with most Disney musicals, we get the one song that plays over and over and is probably the bane of every parent's existence. So maybe this is revolutionary in that it doesn't have that and it breaks away from the formula, but I kind of felt like I was missing that from it. And that might just be me, you know, I don't think it took away from the experience overall, but I think it would have plussed it up in a way that would have made it be like, ah, yes, this is one of my favorite animated films of recent days. The performances are all great. Stephanie Beatriz plays Mirabelle, who's the sort of main young woman in it. You've also got Diane Guerrero, John Leguizamo, Wilder Valderrama, Renzi Felix, Angie Cepeda, and I, you know, again, it's beautiful. I think kids will enjoy it. I think adults will enjoy it. There's nothing overtly wrong with it. I just came out of it feeling like I wanted something a little more elevated, and there are also some, like, plot things that I would have liked to see them break away, again, from cliches, but I won't spoil those. Either way, I'm not trying to rain on its prey too hard. If you are looking for something pleasant to see this weekend, this is absolutely a great choice. Encanto is out in theaters now. It will be on Disney Plus in late December if you're not ready to go back to theaters. And I personally am going to give it a 4 out of 5. And speaking of Disney Plus, the Beatles docu-series slash documentary Get Back is out now. It's directed by Peter Jackson and it's a three-part docu-series and it is long, like Lord of the Rings level long. It is nearly eight hours long and I'm gonna go ahead and argue that it might be too long. So huge fan of the Beatles, love them, love everything they did, you know, watch the Beatles anthology, have watched all their movies, have definitely absorbed a lot about them over the years. I would say maybe the veracity of my fandom has not petered out, but it's, you know, th at a certain point you learn a lot about them. And not a lot of things give you a new perspective. Now, I will fully acknowledge that Get Back gives you a very, very intimate look at the Beatles. And it's almost like watching a school group project fall apart. I mean, obviously the end result did not fall apart, but it feels like you're watching that sort of dynamic where one person is unhappy with the way the other two are like stealing the spotlight and one person is just totally on drugs the whole time. Just kidding. They're mostly on drugs the whole time. But Ringo is like really out of it for this. So basically what happened is Peter Jackson got access to I want to say like 50 60 hours of footage that Michael Lindsay Hogg who is a documentarian had filmed during during the making of the Let It Be album originally it was going to be some live huge spectacle show they talked about doing a cruise at one point all of this stuff eventually we get the very famous Apple Records rooftop concert but that's at the very very end of it so you're basically watching the Beatles work through putting together Let It Be, 14 new songs. It's so impressive listening to them and how, you know, they're like, let me try this out. And you're like, that's a, a more amazing song than most people will deal with in their entire lives. Holy cow. But at the same time, 
what really creeped me out about this documentary is, and I have not seen They Shall Not Grow Old, which is something I guess Peter Jackson applied the same technology to. So when I think most of us saw the trailer for Get Back, it was like, oh, wow, this is very artfully restored footage. You know, it looks like it theoretically maybe could have been filmed relatively recently as opposed to being like, hey, this is from the late 60s. Very impressive. But I think the thing about the trailer that's misleading is, okay, that gives you, let's say, three to five minutes of synced sound and picture and all these things and what's misleading about the docuseries is that and they they are upfront about this but they go you know sometimes the picture didn't survive and we've attempted to match the audio to you know the most well-intentioned thing that applies to the story but they're weaving the story together and you know the story is clearly there but I think the bits and pieces they are showing us feel too manipulated there's this thing on reality tv they call frankenbiting where it's like oh you know you may say three different sentences and they cut them together and put a different image over it so you can't tell that you've said something completely different it makes things sound more dramatic and I think the most specific example of this is in you know uh, Paul is talking about Yoko and clearly what he has said he has said about Yoko like I believe that he said all those words about Yoko but the the visuals do not match at all he's not saying those things in those moments and so the, the you know the the emotion doesn't match and it's also just really creepy to sort of watch like the the sort of muppety mouthness of it or like barely moving mouths I found the visuals really off-putting and so I think what ended up happening is I, I kind of ended up listening to big bigger parts of the docuseries as opposed to watching it because I, you know, I know what the Beatles look like. I don't need to see them doing all these things. If you want to see them chain smoking and like drinking a bunch of tea and beer and wine and all that stuff, like that's fine. But I do think the audio is more compelling than the visuals end up being, especially with the disconnected lip sync. So I think if you are a super duper fan of the Beatles, you're going to watch this. I don't know if you're going to enjoy it as much as it. Also, they, you know, It's definitely an intimate and slightly less filtered look at them. I think it still tries to keep to like a relatively family friendly, not not completely family friendly, but relatively family friendly content. There's a point where like John Lennon starts talking about something and and you literally see Paul McCartney look at the camera and be like, maybe not this. And I'm sure they've kept a lot of the saucier stuff out of this documentary. So the editing of it not only feels manipulative, but it's also like, well, you're also, I mean... Yeah, you're showing them be realistic at each other and like combative and nitty gritty and any group that works together and and especially creatives, you know, there's going to be friction, but sometimes they're just really mean to each other. And it's like, oh, cool. If you really want to watch what is eventually the decline of the Beatles, this is it. You know, again, one of their most impressive albums, but also this is the end. Like you are watching the end. So for the, again, super duper Beatles fan, Yeah, you'll get like tiny, tiny bits and pieces out of this that are maybe new information. Uh, You'll probably just enjoy the music and absorbing it. And I don't know if you need to watch all three parts. I think if you, again, if you fall into that super duper Beatles fan category, you will end up doing so. But just story-wise, it's like, this is also not for not Beatles fans, right? Like it does a very brief thing job in the beginning of being like here's the Beatles they are the biggest band on earth and admittedly if you don't know who the Beatles are you you know you maybe you're really young and you need some educating on music history but it's definitely not meant to be the rise and fall of the Beatles it's the very peak before the fall of the Beatles it's not a a retrospective of their entire career the docuseries did do one thing that really cracked me up it would give everyone little title cards but because for the most part this is aimed at Beatles super fans it was very funny because it would go like okay Michael Lindsay Hogg the documentarian someone who you might not visually know what they look like Uh, George Martin their producer someone you might not inherently visually know what they look like and then it would be like Yoko Ono it's like okay well if you're a Beatles super fan you you know generally speaking what Yoko Ono looks like and then sometimes it would label the Beatles themselves I was like we we know who they are we like who who are you labeling them for (laughs) who are you labeling them for I don't understand so it was it was just very bizarre where it was trying to be like inclusive but also clearly aimed at a very specific audience and it just kind of made me like a little bit sad watching it because in that sense it's somewhat successful about showing them in a more realistic light and you know I don't go around being like ah yes they were the perfect band ever but for me it's just we've had such a downer of the year I don't want to watch more downers from people who I really admire so I was like oh I just I'd rather go watch a hard day's night or something like that which is just before their brokenness people and fame has destroyed their lives so if you are a super fan it doesn't matter you're gonna watch this anyway if you're somewhere in the middle and you're like I'd like to learn more about the Beatles 
I don't know if this is it for you. I would actually suggest Beatles Anthology instead. And then if you're a casual fan, this is very much not for you. Watch one of their movies, watch Anthology, just, uh, you know, come to this someday maybe. But uh, that's that's my warning on the Beatles Get Back. I truly did find it too bloated. I, I think it could have used a couple more editing passes. And I think it's so obsessed with the fact that it has access to them, you know, just like riffing and playing other people's songs. That's like, you know, we got to get them all in. Anyway. Beatles Get Back is out now on Disney+. Plus.